Hello everyone, my name is Elite Trainer Kenway. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet received a massive amount of hype from fans over the last year leading up to its release a couple of weeks ago, believing them to have answered all the criticisms laid at Sword and Shield upon their release. After eight generations, we were finally getting a true open world Pokemon game, as well as the invitation to take on the gyms in any order we chose. These two improvements looked like they were going to cement Scarlet and Violet as the best Pokemon games to date. But then, the games came out, and oh boy, there were some problems. On release date, Twitter exploded with an endless number of fans ragging both the Pokemon Company and Game Freak for the messy, buggy, unfinished state these games were shipped in. And then soon after, the YouTube video started rolling out, with content creators all over this platform hell-bent on pointing out every single flaw these games have. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We did that last week. Today, we're here to talk about what's not in the game. We're here to talk about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's missed opportunities. First up is Skeledurge. Well, not Skeledurge himself, but rather the bird that hatches from Crocodilor's egg when it evolves. We see this bird sing, we see this bird attack Skeledurge's opponent, and this bird even has its own Scarlet Dex entry. So why isn't this bird its own Pokemon? It's specifically mentioned to have a soul, so we know it is a Pokemon, but why does it have to be like the Kangaskhan situation? Why can't we use this bird in battle aside from Skeledurge? Next up, What's up with these gyms? These gyms are three or four stories tall, yet when we go in them, we're only able to go to the lobby. And the battle stadiums aren't even in the gyms themselves. Even when we have to go back to the gyms as champion to test these gym leaders the second time, we still cannot go past the lobby. So that begs the question, what is in these gyms? Even something as simple as providing offices for the gym leaders in these buildings would have given something to us lore hunting fans to latch on to. For example, we know the teacher Time and the gym leader Rhyme are closely related. However, something simple as having a letter written from Time to Rhyme in Rhyme's office would have been cool. Imagine if we got to go into Larry's office to see the email that Gita wrote to him telling him he had to be the gym leader. Imagine going into Grusha's office to see snowboarding pictures and trophies everywhere. There were so many opportunities Game Freak could have taken with these gym leader buildings and they just didn't. They made these lobbies completely identical like they were Pokemon centers and I don't know, to me it just seems like it would have been a great way to expand on these gym leaders and give them real personality aside from just vehicles to give you badges. Alright, this next one seems like a no-brainer for anyone who's ever played an open world game. As any fan of the genre will tell you, one of the best things about open world games is finding easter eggs hidden across the map. So you can bet that one of the first things that I did when I got access to all of Coridon's abilities was to go to the top of the tallest mountain in Paldea to see if there was an easter egg there. And I found absolutely nothing. By contrast, when you go to the top of the tallest mountain in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you'll find the legendary sword Excalibur. And while you obviously can't remove Excalibur from the stone, it does fill you a sense of wonder of what else can I find if I look in every corner of this map. Even if you couldn't use them, it would have been cool to at least have found them. Oh, this? Yeah, that's right. I am the legendary King Arthur. And don't forget it. This next one just doesn't make any sense to me. Why did Game Freak give us a non-linear Pokemon game with linear gems? Fans have been begging Game Freak for years to give us the opportunity to take on gems in any order we'd like. And Game Freak's response was, yeah, we'll give you the gems out of order, kind of. Like, you can kind of do the gems out of order. I know I did Grusha like sixth, and I did the Bug Gem like third, and I didn't realize she was supposed to be first. Uh, so you can kind of do the gems out of order, but it's gonna be a lot harder to do that. And, and, and Game Freak just kind of gave us what we wanted, but at a cost, and I just don't understand why they did that. And of course, the fan base is split, with some fans wanting dynamic gems and other fans liking the difficulty. And I've actually come up with a solution that would appease everybody. Have the gym leader detect how many badges you have, and then give you the option to fight them at your current badge level or at full power. For example, if you chose to go north and fight Grusha's gym first, you would have the option of fighting this team or this team. But essentially, each gym would have eight slightly different teams depending on your badge level, but it would ultimately be your decision as to how you wanted to face these gyms. This would give the player an endless number of playthrough opportunities. All right, so this next one is extremely petty, but I don't necessarily like the Terra designs. They're just covered in diamond with hats on their heads and that's it, and I'm not a fan of that design. X and Y spoiled us with Mega Evolutions, Oras gave us more Mega Evolutions and the Primal Reversion Kyogre and Groudon, Sword and Shield gave us Dynamax and Gigantamax Pokemon, and Scarlet and Violet just kind of gave us Pokemon with hats. 
and I kind of feel like that's a step backwards. There is one more missed opportunity connected to the terrestrialization phenomenon that to my knowledge, no one has mentioned but me. And I honestly think it may be the biggest missed opportunity in the game, especially on a competitive level. Now you're gonna have to stay with me on this one for just a moment, but how cool would it have been to have a single Pokemon in Paldea whose ability allowed it to hide its Terra type? Now in the anime, we know that there's a Crystal Onyx who basically looks like a terrestrialized Onyx, but without the hat. Now imagine if there was a Pokemon in Paldea whose hidden ability made it look like the Crystal Onyx. Imagine if you had a Pokemon you could terrestrialize and your opponent would have no idea what its Terra type was until one, two, or even possibly three turns later. That Pokemon would be an instant hit with competitive players. And honestly, if they don't include a Pokemon with this hidden ability in what's obviously gonna be an upcoming DLC, probably next year, that's gonna be their biggest missed opportunity in my opinion. Hopefully, if they do make this a real thing, it won't be tied to a legendary Pokemon because that would be way too overpowered. The next missed opportunity in my opinion is the lack of Kalos connection in these games. Now, I've made it no secret on this channel that Kalos is my favorite region by far, and would we realize that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's gonna take place in what's basically the Iberian Peninsula? Everybody thought there was gonna be some kind of connection to Kalos in these games. I'm still hoping for a Kalos DLC sometime next year. But at the very least, they could have included some kind of connection to the Kalos region aside from the abstract painting of Greninja in Nimona's house. And I didn't even realize that painting was there until I watched Bird Keeper Toby's Easter egg video a couple of days ago. And I think that if I were to put some sort of Kalos connection in these games without putting Kalos itself in the future DLC pack, I think that I would have included some sort of familial link between Gita and the Anastar City Psychic Gym Leader Olympia. To me, they both kind of look like they could be loosely related, and both of their official artwork designs have their left hand in the exact same position, which admittedly is a very loose connection, but Pokemon has been known to make these loose connections with family members in the past, especially when Legends Arceus came out. Right, so before we get to the last item on the list, go down to the comments section and tell me what you think Scarlet and Violet's biggest missed opportunity was. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and check out another video. And think about subscribing if you haven't already. I'm trying to improve these videos each and every week and the best way I can do that is with your feedback. So I forgot to go into detail about the future Paradox Pokemon for this list, but I absolutely want to include them on the list. I hate the future Paradox Pokemon. They're literally just, what if Pokemon but metal. And that's to say nothing of the biggest missed future paradox opportunity, f***ing Porygon 3. We have been waiting for Porygon 3 since generation four, and this was the perfect opportunity to give us an actual Porygon 3, and they completely forgot about it. Everybody wants Porygon 3. We all want to see what the perfected, complete form of Porygon 3 is supposed to look like, and they completely forgot it. Oh! That's not what this last entry is about. This last entry is about Gita, and you all probably knew this was coming. Gita's team at the end of the game sucks. Larry was harder to fight than Gita. The Dragon member was harder to fight than Gita. The Titan Dodonzo was harder to fight than Gita. The 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 last uh, I, I can't think of her name right now, but the fighting uh, Team Star member was harder to fight than Gita. Gita is without a doubt the easiest champion in any mainline Pokemon game. Not only does she send out Glamora last, even though it should have gone first to set up Toxic Spikes, but she also has two Pokemon that we fought before in Espathra and Veluza, meaning we already know how to deal with those two Pokemon before we even get to her. And probably the worst thing about her team is that she has not one but two single type really easy to take down Pokemon in Avalug and Gogoat. Now I absolutely love Gogoat. I used Gogoat on my first playthrough of Scarlet, but I'm not the main boss of a Pokemon game. The champion is supposed to be much, much harder than this. Not only should the champion have Pokemon that are difficult to counter, but they also should have Pokemon that you likely haven't seen before you get to that point in the game. That's one of the reasons why Cynthia is heralded as one of the toughest champions, because you likely didn't see Garchomp or Spiritomb before you got to her. Now, I've never tried to set up an NPC's team to improve it in any way, because I don't know how good I am at team building, but I think that I can improve Gita's team. Instead of using these six Pokemon, I would have Gita use these six Pokemon. Have Gita send out Palafin first, 
Swap Palafin for Baxcalibur because you're certainly not going to bring a fire type Pokemon to fight against Palafin. After Baxcalibur, swap Palafin back in in its superhero form, then bring in Scovillian to take care of what probably was a grass or electric type you used to take down Palafin, then bring in Espathor because I guess it's a little more threatening than Belooza. For the fifth slot, I'm kind of torn between Tinkaton, which I really like, or Golden Go, which I'm convinced that 99% of players would not encounter on their first playthrough before getting to the Elite Four. Honestly, I kind of want to keep Golden Go and Tinkaton on her list and get Espather off there completely, but that would give her three still types because her ace, instead of Glamora, would be King Gambit. However, given that King Gambit has a four times weakness to fighting type Pokemon, I believe that King Gambit's Terra type should be Fairy, giving it what I believe is a pretty good coverage. But anyway, this is Gita's team. This is my official replacement for Gita's team. This is my preferred replacement for Gita's team. And sure, why not? Let Gita be a still type specialist. Anything is better than what she has now. The champion of the region should be one of the most epic fights in every single mainline Pokemon game. And anything less than that is a major missed opportunity. So that is it for you guys. I hope you have a fantastic week. If you want to hear my final review of Generation 8 as a whole, you can check out that video right here. And if you want to hear my thoughts on the good, the bad, and the ugly with Scarlet and Violet, you can see that video right here. Peace.